Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Julie Mayshuk, Director of Global Programs in 92nd Street Y's Belfer Center for Innovation and Social Impact. Thank you so much for joining us. Tonight's conversation is part of a new initiative from the 92nd Street Y called Campaign for 100%. Between now and Election Day, we're hosting a series of virtual conversations that explore the impact of more people voting on individual lives, communities, government, and society as a whole. Please go to 92y.org forward slash campaign for 100% to learn more. 92nd Street Y would like to thank the Jack Brooks Foundation for their support of Campaign for 100%, their collaboration made tonight's event possible. Please join me now in welcoming Jeb Brooks, founder of the Jack Brooks Foundation. Hello and welcome to the 92nd Street Y's Campaign for 100% program. I'm Jeb Brooks, chairman of the Jack Brooks Foundation. Tonight's important discussion is making an impact, voting, good public policy, and overcoming partisanship. Our foundation's mission is simple. Engage to inspire and inspire to vote. We want every individual to reconnect with our representative democracy through participation in the entire voting process. Tonight we will discuss the legend and the legacy of Chairman Jack Brooks, who served this country in Congress for 42 years. Congressman Brooks devoted his life to crafting quality, effective public policy and is an exceptional example of a representative working for all of America, regardless of political affiliation. The high standards exemplified by Chairman Brooks must not be relegated to the history books. Those standards are even more important today and current politicians would do well to follow his example. Jack Brooks knew constructive change doesn't just happen because you think something isn't right. It's tough, tedious work. We at the JBF will continue this tough, tedious work through initiatives like our Help America Vote Challenge. This challenge will encourage local groups working within their community not only to improve voter turnout, but also to promote participation in every election. We hope you will stay connected with us at jackbrooksfoundation.org. JBF initiatives will inspire individual participation in our nation. There are many different views among Americans. Whomever you are, and whatever change you would like to see in this country, casting your vote will help to make that change. And now, we hope you enjoy tonight's presentation. Hi, good evening, and welcome to the first part of a two-part program. Um, I'm, I'm here with uh, two experienced journalists. We're going to talk about Jack Brooks. First, we have Henrik Hertzberg. He's an American liberal journalist. He's best known as a longtime political commentator for the New Yorker magazine. Um, I could go on, but... Long resumes here, so I'm, I'm going to provide the top lines. And of course, Tim, Timothy McNulty, he's uh, one of the uh, co-authors of, of the book on, on, on Jack Brooks, and he, he was the National Foreign White House correspondent for the Chicago Tribune, and he taught at the University of Chicago and my alma mater, uh, Medill, University, Medill School of Journalism. Um, so I want to start, get, get right into, into, into the book. Tim, uh, I, there, there's a lot of anecdotes in there uh, that that are impressive. One that was particularly impressive to me is there's a point where Bob Dole, senior Republican, is negotiating with with Democratic leaders in the House, and them, and and he asks the Democratic leaders for a signed guarantee of of whatever they're promising, and they say, do you? And the leaders say, do you want also a signed guarantee from Jack Brooks. And he's like, no, his word is good. Is, I mean, this doesn't happen today in today's Congress. And the Congress that, that I cover, it's just not common. Do we need to get back to this? And is there a path to get back to the, this sort of politics? Well, I think there was a, a sense, too, that, the, that compromise was what made things work. Uh, that's the legislation. Uh, if it if it was a zero sum game, um, whoever was on top at the moment would be the only winner, and they just left resentment on the other side. Uh, 
they understood Brooks and and uh, others of his generation understood that it was important to get people to uh, give something or give up something. Uh, and so that is what made it work. Uh, Bob Dole, uh, he, that anecdote is, is something that does illustrate not only the, um, the way it worked by, by personal relationships, but also the sense of integrity that people came to expect and, uh, and cherish. And so I think the, if you don't, if you're not dealing with someone who has, uh, integrity, then you never know what, uh, promise will be kept. Uh, what will be broken? So I, I think that's the the lesson from that anecdote. And it's impressive that it's sort of an not only across the aisle, it's it's across the Capitol. It's it's between chambers of Congress. Uh, back to the 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 first question is: Is it possible to get back to that? Rick, uh, <laughs> well, it will it'll be a hell of a task to get back to that. Uh, the ecology of, of Congress is so different now from what it was in Jack Brooks' day, uh, where when actually in, in no, in, at that time, each party was also a coalition. Each party was a coalition of, you know, a few, some li liberal Republicans and conservative Republicans, conservative Democrats and, and liberal Democrats. So the idea of compromise and uh, horse trading was kind of built into the into the way it was structured. Now things are so polarized. Uh, that's that's one of the differences. Another difference is that there are no or few recognized journalistic authorities. There's a, there's Fox News and there's MSNBC and there's CNN floating around. Uh, Moreover, more on the MSNBC end of things than the Fox News. Uh, end of things. But these conditions make it a hell of a lot more difficult to do the kind of work that Jack Brooks did. Now, before we paint a picture, like a rosy picture of the good old days, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things Jack Brooks did, he, he drafted the articles of impeachment uh, against President Nixon. Um, we, I, I think people forget, but we, I mean, we had an impeachment this year before everything else happened this year. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> You know what, and 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 there were scandals. There, there was around Contra. There was the the eighties were not a particularly easy time politically, although now they look like a cakewalk. Um, but what 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 are the lessons that we learned from Jack Brooks? And I know there are many on sort of the limits of presidential power and and how much Congress can can put a stop to a president if congressional leaders decide. That the president's going too far. Well, I think that uh, as we can see, like daily, um, the, uh, the presidents will take and, uh, and go up to the limit of their uh, in personal integrity, um, and it's up to Congress to say that's enough or stop there. Uh, and I think it's something that individual congressmen have to, um, to deal with and on their own conscience. Um, I think it's, you know, like I say, our, our, the daily experience of reading the newspaper shows that it doesn't, doesn't happen very often. You don't get people bucking their, uh, bucking their party or their allegiance to the president. So have things changed so much that current members of Congress don't have anything to learn from, you know, the, the biggest names of the past century? Or, or is there still something, is, is there still a line that connects the way Congress worked when Jack Brooks wanted to be chairman and that was his ultimate goal was to be chairman? Now, now members, it seems sometimes, or they're criticized, they all want to be president. Well, he wanted to be uh, chairman of the judiciary, as you say, and, and, uh, and he wanted to serve his district. So uh, he was interested in power. It was not that he wasn't a partisan. He was, a, he was extremely partisan, um, but he also recognized that if, if he was going to be a, uh, accomplished, then he would need people from both sides. Uh, he would have to establish personal relationships. It was when, uh, an era when 
people, uh, uh, politicians, and their families lived in the area. Uh, it wasn't they didn't have uh, boys' apartments where where um, six congressmen shared uh, shared a big apartment. They had homes where their spouses um, and children lived and went to school together, and and they also had um, you know parties. Uh, and lunches and dinners together. So it was a very personal time. It wasn't just posturing. And I think maybe what part of it is to get to, to get away from some of the posturing. I, I think when you when Newt Gingrich came in and started using C-SPAN to posture and, and talk to an empty chamber as if he was lecturing um, you know, everyone air. I mean, if, if that's the definition of posturing. Right. There, there's another thing you, you said, Tim, that, that I want to ask Rick about. You you said the, the limits of personal integrity. Uh, and, and you said presidents will go to the limits of their personal integrity. It's been alleged often that the current president, uh, let's say that limit is more extensive in him than it has been in previous presidents. <laughs> and and re many many Republicans would allege that 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 those limits were stretched in the '90s. But it it is continuously alleged. But it is true that this president breaks norms at a speed that you know reporters can't keep up with. Um, so, Rick, I mean. Being that he has been so far politically successful doing that, is that still a limit? You know, are we still stretched to the limits of our personal integrity? Well, I I do think that the Trump uh, phenomenon is uh, is a singularity. Uh, I doubt we'll see it repeated anytime soon, but it has created a, an atmosphere that that makes it makes us think that things have fundamentally fundamentally changed that the, that the model of this ramshackle kind of consensual form of government that we've grown used to over decades and, and centuries for that matter may not be irretrievably broken it may this may be simply a phenomenon of the the accident of Donald Trump now the accident of Donald Trump is made possible by flaws in the Constitution, of two, this two-century-plus mechanism, which, uh, against all common sense and democratic notions, installed a loser in the vote of the people in the White House. And um, one, one, who, one who has um, absolutely no knowledge of, let alone respect for uh, the norms, the informal norms that had made this 18th century invention work in a cranky way, a noisy way, a messy way, but still work. Uh, and it's not working right now. So, Rick, so Rick, you had talk, we had talked earlier and you mentioned two things that uh, could change uh, and that were within the power of Congress to change. One is campaign finance. Mm -hmm. uh, and that certainly is. And also gerrymandering where 90, what I don't know how many, 95% or more of districts are almost uh, solidly either red or blue. And mm -hmm. that it doesn't matter who, uh, who votes in the general election, it matters the primary uh, elections, because if it's a red district, that's the way it's going to stay. To, to be prov provocative, um, would a third element be the return of pork barrel politics? You mean it's a, you mean as a curative? Yeah, as a curative, bringing back the. Uh, I mean, Jack Brooks apparently he was criticized for uh, for for helping his district essentially, which and and at the time I, I believe in the mid twentieth century it was understood as helping your district, taking business to your district, mm -hmm. but then it went away with with Newt Gingrich, as you said. Uh, is is that a curative? Uh, I I think the curatives are going to, or the curatives that I'm interested in go a lot deeper than that because uh, I think that all three branches of the government are hobbled, uh, are problematic now. Not just the presidency and the pre and and the, the pre not just the presidency, but Congress too. The very concept of single member districts is is a problem. I think we. 
I think um, and I hope that that people will start thinking more broadly in terms of larger kind of reforms, um, getting rid, not getting rid of the electoral college, but changing the electoral college so that it reflects the, the national popular vote. That's a change that would be extre extraordinarily helpful and is within grasp. Um, maybe some experimentation with uh, uh, three member districts. I think one of the states, Ohio, I think, had that for a long time. That can break down this, this uh, tribal uh, kill or be killed mentality. And uh, the Supreme Court, which we're, we're now seeing some of the flaws there. Um, you know, there's a, there was an idea that, um, that uh, the governor of Texas who ran for president, he's he got his name now, the Republican. Uh, say what? Rick Perry. Rick Perry, right? Rick Perry in his campaign suggested a, that the Supreme Court, the, 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 there should be 18 year ter terms for the Supreme Court uh, with one term, with a, a justice uh, term expiring every two years. That would avoid the, this kind of freak show that we have now where suddenly the, the Supreme Court um, is almost entirely appointed by one party. So there's a lot, I, th I, I, I hope that one of the things that will come out of the, of the, the uh, the horrible situation we are now is going to be some of that kind of constructive thinking about how we can we can improve the constitution so that the framers would would praise us. I think if they came if they if the framers came around now they'd say you didn't fix that. What's the matter with you? We gave you the amendment process. Why didn't you fix it? <laughs> Well, I think I think I think tinkering with the Constitution and the uh, the the idea of of, uh, of whether that can happen is is a perfect segue to begin the introductions of, of our next two panelists who will be joining us. I actually don't even need introductions, but we'll, we'll give them give them anyway. Um, two women uh, from Texas who, who who represent a lot of. Uh, Texas liberalism, I would say, uh, who are really the voices. Uh, Congresswoman she Sheila Jackson Lee, of course, uh, she's on her 11th term in the House of Representatives. Uh, she's from the 18th Congressional District around Houston. Um, the, some people call her the voice of reason. I, I found as, as a reporter covering this, uh, this, uh, this Congress and the few previous ones, definitely the voice of no nonsense. Um, and and she'll be joining us soon and also cecile richards of course from long texas political uh history uh, she's a national women's right leader um and she's a co-founder of supermajority the new organization that's fighting for gender equality uh i think cecile is ready to join us there you are hey there Welcome. hi cecile hey hi, hi there so We'll we'll start we'll start out. I mean, we're we're talking about bipartisanship, about how to make bipartisanship work, um, and we're talking about tinkering with the Constitution. Uh, you absolutely, as far as I understand it, you need a bipartisan bipartisan cooperation to to actually make a constitutional change. Because I can't imagine an election that would yield one party or the other. And enough power to, to change the constitution by by themselves. So, Cecile, what what do you think is the missing element that that could inspire parties to actually want to work together again? Oh wow! Well, that's I mean, <laughs> I, I think Rick sort of ex ex expressed a little bit how incredibly hard that is. I, I guess my hope is really what I think is kind of the theme of this whole conversation, which is how do we restore democracy in a small D kind of way, mm -hmm. uh, voting rights, representation, things that actually would inspire the electorate and allow the electorate to be more engaged. Because I think what's, what's not working is thinking it's going to come down from on high. <laughs> I actually mm -hmm. think the way change happens is from the bottom up. And, uh, Anyway, I don't know if we'll get into this, but I, I, uh, one of the things I know that Congressman Brooks was so, you know, was so kind of remarkable about about him was supporting the Voting Rights Act and how 
really radical that was in a way for a Southerner. And I feel like he would be looking at maybe like the, like as Rick said, the founders were looking and say like, what, you're doing this again? I, I think he would look at us and say, you I mean, you've actually, you know, now essentially um, made the, the taken all the teeth out of the Voting Rights Act. And we were seeing, of course, in this election, just rampant voter suppression, all kinds of tactics being used, particularly in my home state of Texas to keep people from voting. So one of the things I think we have to do is actually get serious about democracy reform um, in addition to whatever kind of constitutional changes that that we make. And th those are things that we know can get passed by, by Congress. Um, and given the way the Republicans have rewritten the rules in the Senate, things that we could actually probably get done um, even in a, a, a new Congress where the Democrats are in control of the Senate. And on, on that point, I mean, in, in Texas, you do have uh, clearly two different political analyses battling each other. One where 100 percent of the people need to vote or or the more the merrier. You, you're never going to get 100 percent participation um, or at least not, it's never been achieved. Well, definitely not the rules we've got. It's pretty, it's almost and, impossible. Yeah. And that's the thing. Can you actually have a collaborative government with a with a party with two parties, one that believes in, in franchising more voters and one that believes in putting more obstacles ahead of voters? Is that possible at this point? Well, I have my opinion. I'd be eager to hear my my uh, um, co-panelists here, but no, it's really damn hard. But I was, you know, I was just looking at. Um, it's interesting. I mean, we. I'd love to talk about Texas because there's. It's such a state that is like a microcosm in many ways of everything mm -hmm. I think that's happening in this country. But I was just looking at the numbers um, in Travis County, so that's Austin, Texas. Ninety-seven percent of people in Travis County are now registered to vote. And this is despite what is a very, very mm -hmm. tough system to um, to use to register voters. And 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 we're seeing, I was saw a post, of course, today because early voting began. I'm just like literally lines of people waiting for hours starting at 5 a.m. to go vote. And so, and of course, we've seen really somewhat revolutionary change in terms of what happened in the, in the 2018 elections. And I think what, what uh, potentially happened this year and that is just because not because the powers of be wanted people to be engaged or wanted to have a you know sort of a small b a d democratic representation but because people just said well we're going to run for these districts anyway even though they're gerrymandered and folks started winning and i i just i think there is there is sort of an inescapable energy that happens when people believe that they have the power to make change and perhaps the things that governor abbott is doing now um to you know eliminate voting spots. I'm sure everyone's heard that, you know, he, he made one one early vote drop off location in Harris County, which is the third largest county in the country. Uh, it, in some ways, I think per perhaps it's just energized um, people who want to see actually real democracy in the state. Before we go on with that, I'm, I'm curious, one one thing that you mentioned, and, and Tim, uh, I want to bring you in on this one. Um, Jack Brooks, a uh, white Southern Democrat from mid 20th century America decided to support civil rights legislation. Um, it would seem crazy at the time. What, what, what drove him? Well, I think he had an innate sense of fairness is the basis of it. Um, he also had a very strong uh, political mind and he saw his district, which was on the Eastern side of, of uh, Texas and right on the Louisiana border. Um, he had a very mixed um, uh, constituency. Uh, the uh, up in uh, Orange and other uh, towns nearby was the KKK. Uh, and then uh, he had a lot of uh, black constituents who were working in the oil fields. And uh, so I think he understood that in order to make one um, constituent group, he had to kind of represent everyone. Uh, and he had enough political instincts to know how to do that. Um, it wasn't just about, you know, I, I think there's so much now fear and anger. Um, he thought about it more like bringing people together on some common ground, whatever the common ground was. So I think I suspect that that uh, in Texas and in other places uh, like Georgia, I think also had lines of voters that were blocks and blocks long 
Uh, and so that, that, that sense of, wait, this is our country. Um, and, you know, that actually goes for both sides. Uh, it's not just on the liberal or democratic or progressive side. There are people who worry that, you know, if they either are aligned with Trump or they're just aligned with their traditional Republican Party. Um, but everyone, I think, uh, and every American should be concerned. So, so Rick, I, I want you to react to that a little bit. Uh, but one of the genius parts of the U.S. Constitution, I think, is is that it, it sort of uh, structures the perverse incentives natural to politics and makes them sort of act democratically. It, it makes people want to achieve a, a, a united goal and, and people want to get people to vote. And, you know, it, and it sort of, um, it uses the worst of politicians to bring out the best of democracy, although it's clearly a slow and messy process, as, as we know. I think I think we are seeing a sort of outpouring of irrational love for country in the in the the lengths to which people are right now are going to vote. Um, people are people are going to the I mean, here's here's my absentee ballot. I'm casting it even though there's no question about how the vote's going to turn out in my district. I think people are are it, it's a beautiful thing to see people rising up to vote, to vote. And, they're, and when, they, when they say they, they want to exercise the vote, they really mean, I, this is for my country. This is for, this is for all of us. So even in this dark time, um, there's, there is this flash of light. And I was very, very touched with what Cecile was saying. It's, this is, this, things may be not as bad as they look. And, and Cecile, like the, I mean, people are, are inspired for their own reasons, for what they've seen over the past four years, or maybe for what they've seen over the past 20 years. But what do, what can organizations that want more people to vote, whose goal it is to get everyone participating, wh what are some of the like important actions that have proven to really work and to enfranchise people, even given the obstacles like, in places like Texas? Well, I mean, obviously that's a complicated question now since because of the pandemic, uh, it's eliminated a lot of the traditional ways in which like if it, if we're a normal year, we wouldn't be sitting here. We would be out door knocking in Ohio or wherever. And mm -hmm. so right now I think it's much more how do you actually use digital tools as we're doing to make sure that people actually have information, know how to vote, because as we also see, the rules are changing day by day, I don't know if you followed the Wisconsin Supreme Court race, but where literally people are, they had to vote in line, wait in line in the middle of a pandemic because the, the rulings kept going back and forth. And so part of it right now is just getting people basic information. But something I think that's even more inspiring and interesting about getting people to vote is who they get to vote for. And one thing I think has been underreported, and again, I'm going to use Texas since we're all talking about that state. It's such an interesting representation. In Texas, the diversity, and this is what I was thinking of Congressman Brooks, but the diversity of the Texas Democratic delegation, uh, and if Congresswoman Lee um, arrives, she'll have a lot to say about this. But you know, in 2018, um, we elected the first two Latinas ever to Congress from Texas, um, Sylvia Garcia and Veronica Escobar. This year, there are 10 competitive congressional races, despite the fact that we have such bad gerrymandering. These are races that people historically would just say, don't even bother running. In those 10, of those 10 candidates, um, eight of them are women and six of them are people of color. Okay, back in my mother's day, that just did not happen. That was not... Uh, that was not, you know, uh, that did not happen. And I feel like that's what's also happening in Texas and other country, other places in the country is people are saying, oh, my God, I can go vote for someone who actually looks like me and may well, have a lived experience similar to mine. Well, on your point, uh, Congresswoman Jackson Lee is actually ready to join us now. She's, awesome. she's coming in from a remote location. So let's welcome her. Um, Hello, everyone. Uh, Hello, Congresswoman. It's, it's great to have you. Thank you. I hope I'm, I'm uh, you know, for a little bit of humor, uh, Cecile, I hope I'm sitting up straight. I think you can see uh, where I am. I'm, I'm not really in the in the comfort of an office or a living room, <laughs> uh, but um, I'm on, I'm rolling. 
but I'm delighted <laughs> to be here. Thank you so very much. So good to see you. It's a, it's you. a complicated year. Every We're all uh, logging in from wherever we can. And, um, but you joined us, Congresswoman, at the exact right time because we are talking about participation and expansion of voters, uh, the voter rolls essentially in Texas. Um, so I, I guess the, the real question is, in 2018, you saw Democrats, uh, and Cecile just mentioned this, have massive success. Uh, women of color get elected the first two, two Latinas. You, and, and in 2020, at a congressional level, the Democrats are, are, are attacking Texas hard in, in a way that you know we haven't seen in decades, um, despite all of the obstacles to vote, despite of, of how difficult it is for people of color to, to register, to go to their only... So basically, why is this, Congresswoman? What what is it that that makes it that these obstacles are suddenly not impassable anymore? Well, let me first of all say, uh, in uh, out of respect for the Honorable Jack Brooks, I'm reminded of my first meeting with him uh, in Washington with a great deal of excitement that I'd be able to come on a, under a mighty oak tree uh, because that is that is the sense of his leadership in Congress when I came uh, and he was, could not be a truer Democrat. So I'm delighted to be here. And then uh, Cecile, I want you to know that your mother's race for treasury secretary or uh, the treasurer of the state of Texas was my first statewide race. Uh, and when you work for Ann Richards, you don't sit down. So I come <laughs> to this meeting with the idea that we're now at a moment in history again, where I'm finding that no Democrat wants to sit down and I want you to know that there are obstacles because there is no intent on Republicans to lose. There's no intent right now to indicate and collaborate, which I, I, when I came to Congress, we did that. And I love doing that. Even as a progressive, I love the opportunity to be able to work together with my colleagues. But I've been out today. Today was an uh, early vote. Uh, and I've been to uh, sites with students. I've never seen the, the level of excitement from students of being able to change the direction, the tide of America by their vote. Uh, and as well, uh, I've been in areas where you would typically say uh, impoverished areas where voters would say, what is it in it for me? Two ladies in particular that walked from a public housing community. I never say projects, their homes. Uh, and they said, I said, please go back and tell others. They said, well, we are here. That's a good indication that people are seeing their change, their life, uh, their new opportunities in this election. I think Joe and Jill, uh, I think Kamala and Doug have claimed this for us. So the question is that people are more and more feeling that they've been left out and they are buying into what we're saying. That means we have a great responsibility to really be change agents for them. They're buying into what we're saying. Use your vote and your power, and you're going to make a difference for yourself. So what is it, um, going back to, to Texas a second, what, what is it about the state that, that, that produces so many um, politicians of, of high stature, but, but also just such presence you know it's it's really i think texas texas has has marked a huge difference in in u.s politics and it seems that right now as you're saying congressman people are engaged in politics and people care and and that has to do a lot with the personality of the people running but what is it about texas i'd like to think of texas as larger than life uh and we grow up under that mindset that everything is big in Texas. Our voices are larger and louder. Um, what we believe in are large and loud. Um, what we are able to accomplish because the state is so large can be bigger than other states. And then as we've moved into the 21st century, uh, it is important to note that we are becoming increasingly diverse, but we are building a genius in this state that is willing to take the roots of Jack Brooks and Ann Richards, uh, and to take the likes of Barbara Jordan, uh, Henry B. Gonzalez, Mickey Leland, and many others, and to wrap it up as our roots, our ancestry, 
and to be able to move Texas now more than ever into a column of respect uh, and power. And that means that we are tired of being on the back seat in democratic national politics. Mm -hmm. I saw it in the primary. We weren't expected to win, meaning Joe and Jill uh, in the democratic primary. We had real competition for those of us who were advocating uh, for this election, but Democrats got together and all of a sudden that practical hat went on their head. And I'm a progressive and loved all of the candidates. And look what happened. Uh, we set our mind to a victory. So Texas is large, it's a large voice, but we have a soft heart. And I believe that with Texas on the national scene of democratic leadership, national leadership, good things are gonna happen for America. I think we see that we're coming into our moment of maturity with, as Cecile said, electing two Latina uh, in 2018. We had never done that. I mean, that was just overwhelming. It was powerful. We started feeling good about that and almost had a United States Senator. Rick, Rick, Rick tell, me, tell me a little bit about, you know, what happened from 1994 to 2018. Uh, did, did Democrats give up on, and, and uh, clearly not local Democrats, Congresswoman, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that there are very democratic districts in the state, but this whole idea that since uh, W won the governorship, you know, Democrats haven't won statewide. Did did they let go too easy before this new process that the that the congresswoman is talking about? Did did who let go? Did Democrats let go of Texas, um, or or yeah. tell me about this process. <clears throat> Seemingly, I mean, I, I I second everything that the congresswoman just said. Um, I mean, I'm a late comer to loving Texas. <laughs> There's always room. We'll make it, yeah, we'll take anybody. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it's a country within a country. And, um, and it's got, it's got, I would, I'd be happy to live there. I'd be, ha I have to live in Austin, but I would happy to be happy to live in Texas. Um, what can I say, except that, uh, that if there's a resolution on the floor to, pay tribute to and to love Texas, I vote yes. <laughs> can, I, can I add something to what I, just to kind of amen uh, what Congresswoman Lee said and because, uh, and, and I guess to your, to your question about people that were larger than life, I mean, Texas does have this, and not just in politics, but in everything, you know, sort of that, yeah, um, think big and, like we're scrappy folks, um, people don't put on airs, that we're kind of plain spoken. I feel like there's a lot of things about Texas that are really endearing. I do think though, one of the things that is important to recognize is that, uh, I mean, Congressman Lee mentioned, you know, Mickey Leland, some of the greats, Barbara Jordan and whatever, but that was really the exception because generally the Texas Democratic Party did not um, support uh, and encourage women, people of color to run for office. And that wasn't just in Texas, but it was, but I remember when mom ran for governor, it was, it wasn't because anyone said, it's your time. This is, no, it was like, it was scrappy and hard. Um, and so I do think one of the things that's interesting, we can talk about the demographic changes in Texas and the really how the suburbs have just dramatically changed. Again, I think a microcosm of how this president doesn't understand this country when he talks about the suburbs. They are diverse, they are young, they are progressive. Um, but also what we what we were seeing in Texas is not only the congressional level, but in, in um, Congresswoman Lee's um, county, Harris County, Houston is the most diverse city in the country. And in 2018, not only did we have historic congressional races, 17 African-American women were elected to judgeships. Mm -hmm. And a 27-year-old woman, Lena Hidalgo, won as county judge. This, these, this were, these are things that never were supposed to happen. And again, I think it just really speaks to a whole new wave and kind of leadership in Texas. Uh, and obviously, Congresswoman Lee paved the way. And it is so exciting to see, I think, the seeds of all that uh, demonstrating what Congress women look like um, and just bringing in a whole new generation of folks. I, I, I'm telling you, it's hard to really capture unless you're there on the ground, although the Congresswoman has done a good job of it. Something's happening there and it's much bigger than the Democratic Party. Just for uh, for our viewers' uh, sake, uh, county judge in Texas is a big deal. It's the the executive Huge. of a county. So and and Harris County is uh, the 
basically the fourth most, most populous city in, in the country. It holds Houston. Um, and Tim, I want to bring you in, co comment on this. What, what, what do you think, and you're probably the closest to uh, talking to Jack Brooks himself. What do you think Jack Brooks would, would think uh, if he saw this new multicolored competitive Texas that's competitive in a different way than it was when he first got to Congress? Well, he would turn me to answer. Uh, can I step out for my other word or uh, and then I'll come back or say a word and come back? Oh, uh, please, please go go ahead as, as you wish, Congresswoman. We always want and, to hear from you. And 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 uh, I will um, beg his pardon for him to be able to speak, but I'd like to be able to come back before um, you sign off on this wonderful audience. So I, I have uh, the sign off time is when? We, we will have audience uh, participation in about 10 minutes for from 6.55 to 7.15. So we'll, okay. we'll be answering questions from the audience, which- All right, so if I come back, if you'd be kind enough to allow me to say something and then um, in the Q&A, um, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely, I'll send questions okay. your way. I, I have some tall Texans that I'd like to talk about <laughs> and, and what our heart is about here in Texas. Thank you so very much. I'm still on. Thank you. So um, that, that's a good moment to remind everyone, if you have questions, you can start sending them in on, on the chat and we will we will definitely uh, address them. So, so Tim, what, what would Jack Brooks say? Well, first of all, I think his district uh, was um, multiracial um, and he understood uh, that you've got to bring people together. He also understood it that in Texas, um, there are some very wide differences between people like in Harris County and people where uh, back in, in West Texas, where there are, uh, you know, 100 or 250 people in the whole county uh, that you have to have a reconciliation between agricultural interests and the city interests. Uh, he and Dolph Briscoe, the former governor of, of Texas, were fast friends and even classmates at UT. And they would, were both in the Texas state legislature, and they would swap votes because each one needed the other. And so I think that recognition that you're saying Texas is a microcosm of the states, it is indeed. There is the Midwest, there is the coasts. Well, in Texas, you have all that in one humongous state. Um, and and so and by the way, I have two grandchildren in Houston, so I'm partial. <laughs> but but the uh, I think that Brooks would have looked at this and said, you know, if you he was very pragmatic as well as political, and uh, he would say, if we're going to get something done, we're going to have to have people come out and vote, and we're going to have to change the systems, uh, and it won't happen. Uh, and, and Cecilia, I think you said from the top down. It will have to be as it is now, here apparently going from the bottom up, from people willing to stand in line for hours and hours and hours uh, in order to be heard. Now there's, I, I wanna get into, uh, I mean, diversity is expressed obviously in many ways, racial and ethnic, of course, gender diversity, Cecile, uh, you are the perfect person to ask about that in general in, in US politics and especially in Texas. I know that Supermajority released the What What Women Want 2020, um, and, and that's a list of priorities for our leaders. Can you walk us a little bit through through that list, and 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 you know, does it prioritize prioritize one some needs over others, or is it just a series of of needs that that need to happen for gender equality to to become a reality in, in American politics? Well, I think it's interesting how um, women are very pragmatic. And in fact, um, actually what we see in general is that women in elective office, they, they're they not you know better, but there are certain things that they do. They actually do work across party lines more. They introduce more legislation and they also actually support and focus on issues that often get left decide, which are sometimes considered women's issues, but are basically issues that affect every everyone in the country on the economy and healthcare. Right now, given the pandemic, and I again we're I think the the all what the pandemic has done is just 
really put a big spotlight on the issues that women have historically faced in trying to fit into an economy and really a political system that was never built for us to be in it. Uh, and so the issues that that women care about, I don't think are surprising. There is enormous concern about racial um, inequity in this country, about the murder of black people. Uh, and that is that crosses race, that crosses geography. There is enormous concern about what this pandemic is doing to women economically. It's, I know many people are writing about this being the first women's recession, if you will, because women have been on the front lines um, uh, of the pandemic, but will probably be and particularly women of color, the last to recover. They're desperately concerned about healthcare. And I think you'll hear, I mean, you see that in every poll, that's probably the number one issue for everyone in this country. Um, and they care about uh, democracy and voting rights. And that's where I'm hoping, you know, that there's energy coming out of this election, not only on issues, but on actually making s systemic change in democracy. Looks like maybe we're on our own here. Well, oh, I, apparently, I, I have now I had a, my own technical. No, which, no, no. That's a I'm, life I'm, in the I'm, time of COVID. Um, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I, that's all to say. I just think women are the the, the top line takeaway is women are enormously motivated to vote. <laughs> they are right. enormously motivated to vote. They have been many women, and I put myself in this category, have been waiting to vote since the day after the last presidential election, and they've spent the last four years organizing their little groups. They've been marching, they've been knitting hats, they've been going to congressional um, you know, town halls. And right now they're the folks um, in large measure that are outside waiting in hours to early vote um, or to vote absentee. So on, on this point of motivation, Rick, um, it seems that all the people that, and, and any sort of um, voter suppression techniques were designed to stop, are the people who are getting motivated? Is 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 this democracy at work? Is this the way it's supposed to be? <clears throat> well, it's it, it's the way it's supposed to be in reaction to things that are not the way they're supposed to be. But I too I too have been amazed by this uh, the surge of voting of of people holding on to that idea of a vote, even when it's a little bit irrational. You know, even even when they're they they live in a one-sided district or uh, or a one-sided state or something like people are people are the most important thing that's going to be expressed on election day is the love of the hope for democracy. That's what that's what people are voting for. That's what people are excited about, whether they know it or not. That's the only explanation that that makes really makes sense and. It's also a reaction to having a president who is firmly anti-small D democratic. Yeah. And I think people want to express, but to vote for, to vote against Trump is to vote for democracy. Now, I guess open question for anybody who wants to take it. Um, if this election does not provide confident results, hmm. When when people are so motivated and people are taking actually more personal risk than ever to vote, if, if this election is not is not something people have confidence in afterwards, what's the risk there? What happens? Do people stop trusting? Well, I mean, I, I would love to hear what you all say, but. Obviously, we have a president who has already said this pres this election is illegitimate. So he has already sent that message to his supporters that the election's not legitimate. So I don't think it's a question of if. Uh, and I there is I obviously enormous anxiety among certainly on the women we poll, enormous anxiety about what is going to happen. Next, and as I think we, I think we probably all agree, this is not going to be like, like Christmas, where you get up the next morning and find out, you know, what you got. It is going to be a long process, um, and that's not something we're used to in this country. And uh, yeah, I, it's it's um, it's highly problematic. One thing I will mention too that I I just it's been so interesting to me talking to women who are not regular voters, 
who don't always aren't motivated, their understanding of how messed up the, the system is, their understanding that Hillary Clinton actually got 3 million more voters votes mm -hmm. than the current president. And they're like being completely perplexed by why this is the system through which we elect presidents. It, it runs very, very deep, not just with people who, you know, um, read the, uh, read, read, uh, you know, everything in the paper, people understand that we have a system that does not work. And that's something I think that is problematic that we're going to have to address because it does suppress people's engagement. I think if, if one thing we um, will try to maintain is the faith in the institutions, even though it seems now from a distance uh, of three weeks that, you know, we're not sure about that, how stalwart those institutions will be. But there still is a faith that, heck, this is America. We, this is the way we do things. Um, and so if there's going to be disappointment, it'll be uh, disappointment. It'll be extraordinarily deep, not just about who is elected, but about the system itself. The, the flip side of that, so so that we can go into audience Q and A on a on a sort of less gloomy note about democracy. So the the, the flip side is you are seeing really long lines, especially Georgia and Texas today. Uh, people coming out to participate is is it sort of a meta institutional? Is it beyond the institutions that if people come out and participate and really celebrate their democracy, it doesn't really does it matter less? how, say, the president reacts. Hmm. Well, one thing can I just say, I don't think it's a great thing that we're seeing people waiting for eight hours to vote because that's unconscionable that it would take eight hours to vote in this day and time. So, I mean, I'm glad we're seeing it in the sense of the commitment of people, but I just want to kind of put a pin in that, which is we should be demanding ways for people to vote because there's a lot of people who can't take off eight hours of work to go vote. So that's just in and of itself. I don't want us to become accustomed to that and think that's actually the way the system should work. Um, I mean, I guess, sorry to be a downer, but that <laughs> no. that's ridiculous. Fair. That's, that, that is uh, fair. Uh, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll get into uh, audience Q and a now. Um, it's uh, clearly a tough election. And, and we have one for you, Rick, um, on the Supreme Court. Uh, what do you believe is the best way to reform the Supreme Court, specifically in terms of the number of justices and how they're selected? Court packing? Well, court packing uh, is, a, is a negative way of, of talking about it. Um, we call it that because when FDR, when Franklin D. Roosevelt wanted to increase the number of justices in the court. It was something he had not run on. So that's, I think he was right to try to, to fix uh, the court because the court was knocking down everything the New Deal came up with. And after, after Roosevelt uh, did surface the idea of enlarging the court, um, the court started to back off and stopped uh, vetoing everything that the that Congress was passing. So is, is, um, is, is but I do think, this, as I say, I think this idea—it's a radical idea that hasn't caught on. The idea, people are talking about expanding the court. Uh, I'd be in favor of that over the status quo, but but much better really would be to have this staggered uh, every every second, every two years. There's a new justice appointed and a new justice who retires to a lifetime job or a lifetime uh, um, salary. So that, so that there would be some rough approximation of the will of the people and the composition of the court. Because right now, what we're facing now is a court that it's simply not, a, not part of representative government. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the court is an institution that's really at the, at the basis of the stability of the country. We are living in a time when, when, there's, <clears throat> when we, we can start imagining Germany in 1932, uh, where we have a president who is openly calling for flouting or, or cancel, essentially canceling the outcome of an election through violence. Um, we've never had to face this kind of a crisis before. I'm optimistic that we'll get through it and maybe come out the other side with, uh, with a better system. 
but uh, we're in a we're in a kind of danger that we've never been in before, not since the Civil War. So, op open question, a uh, follow up for that: um, Is it is it a good political tool for someone, say like Joe Biden, to hold, sort sort of have it in his quiver? Uh, you know, I, I don't I don't like expanding the court, but I just might have to, depending on what Republicans do in this last month, last three weeks before the election. Um, is is that what what it, we've come down to, really? I, I, I really don't know. I don't I don't it would be very much against Biden's um, uh, kind of makeup and the, his personality to do anything big. Uh, like that, to try to expand the court, the size of the court, something like that. But um, I think it is time for a conversation about the court and its role in American life and about thinking about the court, the way we thought about the presidency and the way we thought about Congress, not as an immutable, uh, uh, but rather as improvable. So I have uh, I have a mixture of dread and hope for <laughs> what's coming. <laughs> I don't think I don't think uh, it's up to Biden to now say what he's going to do about that. No. I think he knows that there's a lot of conversation, and let the conversation proceed. Um, yeah. I think that's important to mm -hmm. have the politics of it uh, kind of out in the open. Yeah. And and that, temperamentally, by it's, it's, it would be very much against. Um, Biden's temperament to, yeah. to take a step like expanding the court. And, and somebody who's, who's served in the, in the Senate judiciary for so long. So that kind of takes us to the next audience question. I'll, I'll leave it up to whoever wants to answer it. This, this questioner says they may be naive, and, and I don't think they are, but let's see what you think. But are there any issues that could actually bring bipartisan support right now is there is there is there any point of agreement i mean apparently not on not on coronavirus relief which would seem to be the the easy one is there though something i mean there's it's i think the thing that is um important obviously is the distinction between the leadership of the republicans in the congress versus republicans across the country because and this is where just I just feel you're such a disservice to where the majority of people are. Most people don't see access to health care and protection for pre-existing conditions is not a partisan issue. That's an issue that affects millions of families and people are concerned about it. Um, addressing the economic uh, effects of this pandemic is not a partisan issue that's hitting people all over the country. So I think that, you know, I actually have, I'm enormously optimistic that there are issues, even issues that we think of as traditionally women's issues like childcare. This is exposed the fact that we have no plan in this country for dealing with you know, supporting families going back to work. These are issues that I hope a next administration, just as examples of ones where there is enormous bipartisan support in the country. The will of the people uh, is really, uh, there. Uh, we just have to have leaders that are willing to lead. Um, and I think to some of the questioners and some of the, the, the messages I'm seeing in the chat, for folks to actually bring people together around issues of enormous commonality. And that's the only way we're going to get through through this pandemic. Yeah, I, I was going to say, you you answered that another question that we had on the chat, um, pretty much, that whether whether people are less polarized than Congress and, and the and the media well or the press le lends them to believe do you do you think we're we're uh we're stuck in a polarization that is that is in some way artificial well of course you know what, what makes news is tension and so as a as a former newsman i recognize you're going to go not so much to the compromises that are uh possible but to the tension between the parties and, and the leaders. Uh, that said, uh, I think it's also important in that, and I believe there's been a lot of uh, conversation and reporting about what can be done uh, to fix things. Uh, and I think that's important for, for journalists to uh, not just 
be outraged, but to kind of spend time and, and energy looking at solutions. So, in in, in, in answering another another uh, audience question, in those solutions, do we do we need to first agree on a basic set of facts, or do we have to sort of lower the bar on what facts are and say, well, okay, facts are solid, liquid, gas, and that's all we can agree on, or, or how do we start that process? I have some alternative facts for that. <laughs> <laughs> It, well, that, it's yeah. I mean, that it's, a, go ahead. Oh, just uh, as we, I guess we've noted once or twice before in this conversation, the the uh, the news universe, the the media environment, is very unfriendly to any kind of reaching across any aisles. And people are living in separate political universes. They simply simply don't know. Well, I, of course, I'm in one of those. I'm in the liberal of one of those universes. So I think I have a pretty accurate view of what, what's going on in the world. But if I were a Fox News viewer, I'd be living in a complete fantasy land. Now, so even my description of what the media landscape is like kind of suggests what a hole we're in when it comes to doing anything unified as a nation. So I... There, there's there's the uh, the rosy question at the end. So where do we where do we keep our hope? Where do we keep our hope in democracy? And and the the way this question was phrased is how can you remain hopeful that that we can remain intact when when all safeguards have been eroded? I, I think activity, uh, action, um, movement, uh, going, getting people uh, out to vote. You don't have to ask mm -hmm. what, who they're going to vote for. Just get them out to vote. Uh, and by doing that, you will perform your duty as an American to make calls, to uh, volunteer to drive people. Uh, I think that is the uh, you know most important thing people can do. There's a lot of doom and gloom in the you know in the punditry, um, uh, and you're not going to change that. But you can change if you uh, walk your neighbor uh, to the polling place. I couldn't agree more. I hate to, I mean, I know all of you all write in or in the media, but I just like turn off the television at this point. It's really not healthy for you. And exactly, just take, uh, whether it's taking your neighbor, whether it's signing up with the organization and doing texting or phoning to folks about voting, they're just, I think that, and that's what we've seen with women is they're just ready to do whatever it is. Um, and I think too that we it, it is easy, easy to get discouraged, but I think what would really be discouraging is if we saw these attacks on our democracy, on our fellow citizens, on families at the border, and there was no reaction in this country. Mm -hmm. I think what's really, to me, inspiring and has been about this past several years is the fact that folks just haven't given up and are continuing to stand up for what I think are really bedrock values in this country. Uh, mm -hmm. And it and and the the other piece of this is, I think, taking joy in the success of some of the new um, leaders that are coming into office and that are willing to challenge the status quo. Uh, 2018, I mean, that wasn't that long ago, record number of women, women of color elected to Congress, and they didn't they didn't like stand in the background, you know, waiting. Mm -hmm their turn. And I, I just, that's when democracy works best. I was actually, I was speaking the other day, I'm just going to name drop real quick, speaking to Speaker Pelosi the other day about um, when she came to Congress, less than, I think less than 5% of, of Congress was female. Uh, this year, uh, almost 40% of the Democratic delegation is, is are women. And so I just think that change is happening. And uh, you can dwell on, and, and it's important to pay attention to the, to the really tough stuff that's happening, but it's also easy to get energized by um, how people are, are not just sitting back. It, it, so uh, one, of our, one of our viewers um, pointed out the, uh, the elephant in the room. They have a point. Um, <laughs> we, we were supposed to have a presidential debate. Uh, I believe it was tonight, um, which, you know, so I'm, I'm glad that all the people watching get to watch us have a conversation with as few interruptions as possible. Um, 
you know, it, it, it certainly makes for better viewing, I hope. Um, <laughs> but, but the question here is, going back to Jack Brooks, what, what would he think of this, of avoiding a debate, avoiding the, you know, the, the, at the height of an election, uh, and, you know, and that's supposed to be in the best interest of the public, and suddenly it, it doesn't happen for, that's a multitude of reasons that we don't have time to list right now. He loved the rough and tumble of politics. He uh, he would go after people who wanted to challenge him on any of the issues he voted on. He would revel in it um, because to him that was the highest form of citizenship uh, and being able to uh, have a take a position to defend your position uh, to believe that you were in the right. And so uh, I think what he would. Uh, he would do is just uh, be as energized as he ever was um, right now. So, C Cecile, connecting that to what you what you just said, what happened in in the last I don't know half century to put a number on it uh, that a lot of people who were disenfranchised, who were at some point told and at some point believed that they just couldn't make it. What what happened? that now they'll fight for a position because it's not easy to get to being a politician if you if you're you know if, if you're supposed to be dis supposed to quotation marks be disenfranchised but people are doing it anyway yeah. what what happened the big mistake this country made was giving women the right to vote <laughs> I just, and i have heard that from more than one man on the on the campaign trail um I mean, this is actually kind of interesting. So, of course, this is the centennial of the beginning of women's suffrage in this country. This this November, well, it was in, actually in August. And, of course, it was an uneven suffrage because uh, Black women, women of color, uh, really didn't get uh, full um, franchise, uh, enfranchisement until the, the Voting Rights Act. But uh, I, I do think that it is, it is ch what's changing is that... Um, people are now saying, why not me? And as, I mean, as Kamala Harris says, you better not, it, it's okay to be first, but you sure better not be the last. And I do think this is the, what, what women in particular are seeing, people of color are seeing is folks saying, okay, they did it. I can do it too. Uh, younger people, people who aren't waiting until they were like my mother's age to run for office. It used to be, you know, in those days, there was one way to to run for office if you were a woman. You know, you had to have a certain hairstyle. You had to like do the, the, the all this. And now you look at just the women that ran for president. So different, so different backgrounds. So I, I just feel like that is, I guess, my hope at the end of the day is that small D democracy starts working because people start stepping up and people support each other. Uh, and we begin to have a government that looks more like us. And then at least we can all make our own mistakes not just be the victims or, uh, you know, sort of have to deal with whatever has been decided by a very small group of people who don't represent the majority of this country. So we, we have time for one more question. Uh, Congresswoman Jackson Lee, of course, was, uh, was a joining from an outdoor event. So uh, her connection apparently didn't we, it was the internet was unable to bring her back to us, sadly, but uh, we did get to have her around for, for a minute. But uh, here's a, here's an audience question that we'll end on, uh, and we can start with you, Tim. Who else? I, and I, I think everybody should answer this one. Uh, who else be, besides Congresswoman Jackson Lee is continuing the legacy of Jack Brooks's work today? I think uh, tens of thousands of young people are now getting involved, uh, and who they hadn't thought about it very much uh, in earlier elections either because they were too young um, uh, or because they just weren't interested in, in politics. Um, I have a granddaughter here in North Carolina who is going to be 18 three days before uh, the election. Um, she was able to already vote in the primary because she could at 17. Uh, but I think that they uh, are really mobilizing uh, in ways that maybe not since uh, our generation or at least Rick and my generation in the 60s, <laughs> and where they are looking at things and saying, yes, they can make change and it's the world they're going to live in. I mean, the things that they're interested in, climate change for one, we haven't even talked about yet. Um, and that's something that they know that's going to impact them 
for the rest of their lives. I totally second every word Tim just said. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of hard to top, actually. That, it, it, it is inspiring. Um, and I think, I, I know I said, I know I was perhaps too critical about lines of people voting. I just think it's outrageous that it is so hard. But the fact that today, 21 days out of this election, 11 million people have already voted, um, it's that's just a sign that we have a healthy democracy. And I think Jack Brooks would love that. Amen. Actually, I, I think uh, I think that is a that is actually a great place to end this. Um, we we had a uh, Congressman Sh Sheila Jackson Lee with us uh, for for a minute there. Um, we had Tim McNulty and Cecile Richards and Hendrik Hertzberg and this for the 92nd Street Y and the Jack Brooks Foundation. I am Rafael Bernal, and this conversation has been great. Thank you all for um, chatting. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Okay, before we go, we're going to hear some closing remarks from Congresswoman Jackson Lee. I just want to close by simply saying how grateful I am to the Jack Brooks Foundation and for this wonderful presentation dealing with voting and turnout and how do we go back to a sense of bipartisanship. Well, I started by saying Texas is large, our voice is large, our heart is large. And we've done the collaborative work years and years and years. I know the Honorable Barbara Jordan did it, LBJ did it, Ann Richards did it, even though we were strong Democrats. I hope to do it, I have done it. And so as we look to 2020, I simply want to say, we can look to social justice, the improvement of civil rights, the understanding of the idea of so many lives matter, including Black Lives Matter, we can find in each other the understanding of our religion and our background uh, and our sensitivities. We can find our passion for better health care, climate, uh, and many other things. And I think today we have emphasized that Texas does it big. I'm frankly hoping that we'll have the opportunity to see change in America. When we see change in America, Texas will be a large part of it because we were so instrumental in the years of our history in the United States Congress and the United States Senate. Our Texas leaders were leaders in the nation. So as Congressman Jack Brooks was, even in the times that he lived, how he understood civil rights, he understood bringing people together and he was tough. So I'm delighted to have been able to be here to say that the more we have Texas voice involved, the greater turnout we have, the more opportunity we will have for the best leadership this nation can ever see. Thank you for having me, uh, and I look forward to working with you. This is Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee saying thank you, thank you again. Yeah.